Thank you. It's good to see everybody today. It's a really, uh, a really good day. It's a little overcast outside, but it's a really good day uh, for us, I think, and we're uh, very pleased to be here today. I want to respectfully uh, acknowledge uh, the history, customs, and cu culture of the Musqueam of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation, on whose uh, traditional lands and home we meet today. Uh, joining me today is Dr. Ramnik Desange, the president of the Doctors of BC, who we'll hear from in a few moments. Uh, we're obviously, this is a very significant day for people who uh, care about primary care in BC. It's a transformational um, announcement we're making today uh, in May. As um, all of you will know, Premier Horgan and I met with the Doctors of BC. We committed to working closely together to support doctors in our province through a collaborative and multi-phased approach. In August, together, Dr. Desange and I announced stabilization funding of $118 million to support family doctors with overhead costs. This uh, stabilization funding uh, made a significant difference, and it has been as close to fully subscribed as such a program can be, $107 million of that $118 million is has gone out or is going out the door in the few days to come. We've had a, a very high rate of uh, participation in the program and we're very pleased about it. There's still $11 million to be sent out and we'll expect that to happen in the next uh, few weeks as the remaining um, doctors take part in that program and clinics take part in this program. It's working. Uh, that program, and I think uh, it provided in, in interim support as we worked together on a longer-term solution. And it's because of this work together, this collaboration, that we're here today. Uh, together with Doctors of BC and BC Family Doctors, we've developed a new patient model and have a new tentative physician master agreement. This payment model for family doctors will help protect and strengthen BC's healthcare system by helping to attract new family doctors and retain existing doctors. By supporting our healthcare workers, including doctors, we are helping patients get better access to the healthcare that they need. And that's what matters most, making sure patients get access to that care. This new payment model, which will be available to family doctors beginning February 1st, 2023, provides another option for family doctors that makes a departure from the fee-for-service model under which doctors are paid primarily on the number of patients they see in a day. This brand new model takes into account five factors, including the time doctors, a doctor spends with a patient, the number of patients a doctor sees in a day, the number of patients a doctor supports through their office, the complexity of the issues a patient is facing, and administrative costs currently paid directly by family doctors. It will give family doctors a more equitable payment option one that better recognizes their value in providing primary care, full service care to patients. Importantly, it will help maintain their business aut uh, autonomy, giving them more flexibility to create the kind of practice that works for them, and most importantly, for their patients. With respect to the tentative physician master agreement, I'm happy to announce that the province and the doctors of BC have reached a tentative physician master agreement. This agreement includes several commitments that will better support doctors as they care for patients. It also reflects the, desi the desire and commitment of the doctors of BC, the government of BC, and BC health authorities working together in the interests of patients. The tentative agreement fosters stronger collaboration and reduces the barrier to, barriers to doctors in the delivery of care to their patients. The tentative agreement supports our continued collaboration on key priorities to improve health care including gender equity, reconciliation with Indigenous people, and workplace safety. The tentative agreement we've reached ad addresses work doctors complete after regular operating hours by addressing improvements to existing alternative physician payment contracts and increases. Improving and increasing access to health services for patients will continue to be the focus of doctors of BC and the Ministry of Health working, working groups over the coming months. This includes how to best attach patients with complex needs, a provincial rostering sy system to ensure patient care continuity, a provincial patient survey, and how best to incorporate into the new model other services that family doctors provide outside of clinics. This is all part 
of refocusing and our continuing efforts to, to develop and improve our primary care strategy. In January, as our BC pandemic entered a new phase, we said it was time to renew, rebuild, and strengthen our healthcare system. And the actions we're taking, including achieving this critical agreement, this work together, come from hard work and from working so closely with doctors of BC and BC family doctors to find solutions that strengthen our healthcare system, that renew its essential function, and that build on our support for doctors and for the patients who count on them. So far, our efforts have produced significant results. In June, we started working with resident doctors and new to practice doctors uh, uh, and uh, for incentives to bring them in to ensure that that group of doctors who uh, was entering in to, uh, to family practice in BC would choose full service family practice. I'm happy to report so far 62 doc new physicians have signed contracts and 68 are in discussions about suitable clinic placements. In the terms of the contracts, 151 in total have expressed interest in these incentives. To put that in context, that number had typically been for those contracts 25 in a year. A health human resources strategy that will train, recruit, and retain healthcare workers while redesigning the healthcare system in BC so it works best for patients and health professionals alike. Creating um, new residency positions, 128. At the uh, uh, 40 new undergraduate medical seats, I should say, and 88 new residency positions at the University of British Columbia, and of course, the work we're doing to create a new medical school at Simon Fraser University in Surrey. All of these initiatives are part of and build upon our transformational and refocused primary care strategy. It's my honor now uh, to, uh, to introduce Dr. Desange to say a few words about this uh, exciting day for patients in BC for family doctors in BC, for all members of the doctors of BC. Thank you kindly, Minister. I am excited to be here today as we announce two major developments that we believe that will move us forward in a significant way to meeting some of our health care challenges. I want to thank the provincial government, in particular, Minister Dix, the Premier and Deputy Health Minister Stephen Brown for what has been a true collaboration. The announcements today have been shaped by the voices of physicians in this province, physicians who care passionately about caring for their patients. They told us clearly what they need so that they can provide quality care and be responsive to all of their patients' needs. This will not happen overnight. There is still much work to be done, but I believe today we are at a milestone. The new physician master agreement that will be going to our members for a vote in the next few weeks. It is by far the best agreement negotiated for physicians in Canada this year. And I believe it is one of the best that has ever been negotiated here in BC. It allows us to target funding to areas that need it most so that we can ensure physicians both family doctors and specialists are recruited and can stay in their communities and also have the tools and resources to provide the level of care to their patients. On a personal note, I'm particularly proud of the commitment within the agreement to address gender equity across the profession and to integrate cultural safety and humility into all of our work. Our new family physician model, co-developed by doctors of BC BC Family Doctors and the Provincial Government represents a se seismic shift in the way we practice in BC. It is a model unique in Canada, bringing together the best of a range of payment models. It addresses rising business costs. It recognizes the value physicians provide when delivering longitudinal care, and it will compensate us for the time spent on evening and weekend administrative burdens. Our hope is that this new payment model will not only stabilize longitudinal family practice, but help make it both sustainable and rewarding. Everyone deserves a family doctor, and this new option is a significant step to help make that goal a reality. As I said, there's still much work to be done, not just to improve the issues that are facing the doctors, but to meet the challenges of the entire healthcare system. BC's doctors are leaders and champions for our patients. With our partners, 
will continue to work hard on behalf of all of our patients. At the end, we needed hope and light for our patients and for the ph physicians that are responsible for providing the care. I am very excited and thank you very much for having us here today. Thank you, Dr. Desange. It's been a pleasure working with you, pleasure for our teams. It's been exceptionally hard work, but I think people will agree that hard work together, building out all of our goals together of team-based care, of providing better care for patients, of, of uh, fully integrating the role of doctors in that, and also and principally for our patients. What this means is that we're making family practice the priority it should be. We're responding to what Dr. Desange and others have called a broken system by restoring the value to family practice that is required by building out a system of lo locums to ensure that people have care when and where they need it, of ensuring that episodic care is more closely connected to the overall healthcare system, that patients are better linked to community care. This will mean better care for patients together. That was the principal goal of the Ministry of Health and the Government of BC. That was the principal goal in all of this work together of the doctors of BC. And I think that we have achieved some of those goals. There is a lot of work to go come. This is one element. This is a key element, but one element of our overall health human resources plan that you've seen in, the, in recent months. But it shows what we can do as we continue to work together with all of the people in the system and with patients as well. Commitment, action, collaboration. They, have, they make possible what we can achieve together in our healthcare system. Over the last uh, two and a half years, we've been dealing with two public health emergencies, and it has had profound effects on everyone, on every single person in BC. I think our system has shown an ability to respond to that that has been remarkable. We face challenges together and we have to take the same approach. Commitment to public health care, commitment to our patients, that's what today's agreement is all about. We're happy to take your questions. Thank, thank you, Minister. As a reminder for media on the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. That's star 1 to ask a question. For any reporters in the room, please line up at the microphone provided and wait to be called. Please make sure to provide your full name and outlet. Media will be limited to one question and one follow-up. We'll start on the phone today with Binder Sajan, CTV. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, so you mentioned that this is good news for people who are waiting for a family doctor. Can you uh, maybe provide that link to people with regards to, uh, you know, in February when this comes into effect, how many more family doctors you expect to see and then how patients will actually get access to them? So this, um, this uh, strongly supports uh, our family practice system. So it stabilizes and supports existing practices, allows them in their terms to build out team-based care. So that's important because our, uh, obviously all those who have uh, care and ensuring that that system is there for the future and replaces a previous system of uh, payment to doctors, that's important for them. It provides incentives and supports for people to choose full service family practice, to choose taking on patient panels of 1,250 and serving their patients in the community, ensuring that that option is equal to other options that new family doctors can provide. And as we build out more options, as we add to our primary care networks, as we add to our system and uh, systems of episodic care, it ensures that people will choose these, uh, these into the future. The core of a successful healthcare system is excellent primary care, is people in the community, doctors and nurse practitioners and nurses and allied health workers providing excellent care in the communities. That's how you respond in, and uh, improve as well all of the other services you provide in acute care and ambulance care and all the other services you provide. So what you're going to see is, um, is I think, uh, and we've already seen this in the uh, response to the initiatives we took together in an interim way, uh, the new to practice contracts and the stabilization package we put forward in August, the willingness and the commitment of family doctors in BC to respond to the needs of their patients. And finally, a rostering system. I think we've had, uh, because of the model we've had in place over a long time, 
and I think both the government and the doctors recognize it, uh, a system that is, was highly uh, diffuse and difficult to understand for patients. So what we're going to put in place together over the next six months is a rostering system that allows people who want a family doctor to have a place that they can connect and then get access to one. A lot of our information about who has and who doesn't have a family doctor is based on federal government surveys. And they, those surveys lose the patient in the process. We've put the patient at the heart of this agreement, and that's why I think it'll be a better deal for patients and for people choosing full-service family practice. Binder, did you have a follow-up? I do, yeah, thank you. And just with regards to the rostering system with about a million people estimated to not have a family doctor, um, how will people be given priority uh, in terms of getting access into a family doctor? Well, there's two sets, I think, of, of patients in that. As you know, um, in 2003, uh, there are about 300,000 people without a family uh, doctor in BC. Um, by the time I became Minister of Health, that's well over 900,000, right? So it tripled, and you recall efforts to address that. Um, I don't want to be too, uh, uh, I won't be partisan here, so I won't mention the various announcements that guaranteed everyone to have in election campaigns by that government, that guaranteed everyone to have a family doctor. The number of people without one tripled in that time. It, went, it, it stabilized in the first couple of years of Minister of Health, it's been affected by the pandemic. So um, that's what, what, this, what you're seeing here is a focus on patients, a focus on the care given to patients, a stabilization of our existing network of family doctors, family practice doctors, our, their ability to build out their practices effectively, incentives to ensure that uh, becoming a full service family doctor is uh, there for people. So what we're gonna see is a system that better cares for people, that focuses on the care, and that was a priority for doctors of BC and for ourselves. And so you're going to see a system that responds better to people, that builds out the number of family doctors and allows people to, uh, to access them by a provincial system. We sometimes in certain divisions of family practice have excellent ways of linking people to doctors now, but we don't have a provincial system. We're going to have that now uh, build out for the six, first six months. So we build out a new system of payment that I think is going to be very positive for family doctors. And then we're going to uh, w uh, ensure that there's a rostering system in place so that you know, you don't have to search around, you don't have to phone doctor by doctor, that you'll be able to connect with our system of family doctors better. So it's, it's, a, it's good news for patients in that sense. We haven't had this before, and it's obviously good for doctors as well. I don't know if you want to add anything, uh, Dr. Sun. I'd just like to add that this new payment model is a new way of doing things. Uh, we're listening to the concerns of many of our family doctors that have left practice or have been contemplating actually leaving. Many physicians across the province had actually given me a deadline of wanting to leave practice because the conditions were so hard. This new payment model enforces the support. It bolsters support for physicians providing the longitudinal family practice care that they have been to their patients. So really stabilizing the efforts on the ground. And our hope is that we're going to be able to retain the physicians we have, but also recruit more doctors. A lot of our new graduating family doctors or have them incentivized to go into residency to choose family medicine because there's a different way of doing things. And we know that we've heard that the burdens and the one patient and one visit and one problem, and we're hoping that this support in this payment model will allow physicians to get back to doing doctoring and also be compensated for their administrative burdens and tasks. Many colleagues are charting long into the night and on the weekends and taking away from their own time with their families. But this puts patients first. It allows patients to actually attach with their family doctors and will build capacity with the existing family physicians on the ground. If we make their working conditions easier and it, the ability for them to be able to teach within their clinical settings and to actually bring in more supportive staff and work towards team-based care, then we're actually doing the best we can for our patients. And Minister Dix is right. This is the first time we've ever implemented such a change. Thank you. Our next question is for Richard Zussman, Global News. Please go ahead. Minister, we obviously have cautioned around politicians making promises about you know how many 
uh, people may be without a family doctor, but are there going to be any benchmarks built into rostering here in terms of how quickly you'd like to see those million people placed with a family doctor? Well, I think one of the issues, I think, uh, and this is a technical question, but when we say that there are people without a family doctor and the numbers, that's in response to something called the Canadian Community Health Survey, which is a survey conducted by at a national level. And uh, as you know, um, uh, that was in the, in the, in the low 300,000 range in 2003, and it tripled in the years between 2003 and 2017. This in spite of the fact that a commitment was made in multiple election campaigns by that government that everyone would have a family doctor. So what this is, what this change is about, is a fundamental change and it's foundation, foundational to all the other things we're going to do. One, rostering systems treat people as individuals. So it's not your response to a survey that might come to somebody from the federal government and allows us to estimate. It allows you to engage with the system. It treats people as individuals. And so it then sends, sets benchmarks for practices and allows people to access primary care in the same way as one accesses uh, other health care services. When you need emergency care, you go to the hospital, you know what to do. And whatever the challenges might be in the hospital, you know what your role is and what you're to do. This allows, I think, and empowers patients. So we're going to be setting new benchmarks, finally having benchmarks in BC, and a system that's linked together. We've agreed to, to work together to have a system that responds adequately to the interests of patients. We've had, over time, a fairly diffuse system. This is, a deal, this is an agree, agreement with doctors that, that uh, I think, promotes um, primary care, promotes it as a career for doctors again, and will bring more uh, doctors into the system. But Richard, it's only one part of it. We need to take action, and we have, uh, to increase residencies. And this agreement supports that by allowing family doctors to support new doctors, community, and to be adequately paid for this. People sometimes say, well, why don't you just have more residencies? Well, they require, it is a serious and important educational process that needs to be supported by existing doctors. This agreement supports that. We need to address barriers to internationally educated doctors and to build out team-based care and allow doctors to work more easily with other professions to provide more care and to increase attachment in their clinics. This is, um, these are exciting and foundational changes that are going to allow us to succeed in many of the other things. It's not 50 strategies, but it's, it's in fact, in this case, 70 strategies linked together, and this is important and foundational to that. Richard, did you have a follow-up? I do. One of the big challenges, obviously, is about regionality. You know, in some areas like here in Victoria, age is a factor. The population's older. They have more reliance on family doctors. In Metro Vancouver, you have, in many areas, a growing population. In the north, you have areas where, you know, if one family doctor retires, it may mean an entire community is not served. So how does this model address the challenges around regionality in British Columbia. And aside from that, uh, there's a change as well around um, nurse practitioners. Can you speak to that and how does that factor in? And, and if Dr. Assange can weigh in whether there are worries, because I know there have been in the past from, from seeing a greater role for, for nurse practitioners in the primary care system. I, I think uh, on the latter, I would say... Um, uh, that there is extraordinary support and collaboration in our system with between doctors and nurse practitioners compared to any time in the past. I, th I think that's just true. That, you know, when I became Minister of Health, we were last in Canada in number of nurse practitioners per capita. One of my predecessors, George Abbott, had really created and as Minister of Health had led um, the uh, establishment of nurse practitioners in BC, but we were last in Canada, and we've dramatically increased the number of nurse practitioners such that I think it was, it will, by the end of this uh, political mandate, have uh, tripled. And so uh, that role will continue in all parts of our healthcare system. What this system does, it, it has been historically very difficult in the 2,000 family practices, less so in the 
UPCCs or the health authority uh, clinics, but where, generally speaking, people have been paid in the same way. But it's difficult when you have a system of independent co contractors and other people coming to the system who are paid differently, and, and, and it's been hard to bring those together. This breaks down some of those barriers, allows family practices to build out their support from nurse practitioners and nurses in such a way that we're going to be able to offer that team-based collaborative care in more ways. On that, we have had right now in BC 58 primary care networks, and there'll be a, an, there will be an ability through them to do that. So I think this is building out team-based care in practice. And I think the work that doctors and nurse practitioners do in particular, and, and registered nurses, and allied health workers together is going to be enhanced by this agreement. And it builds confidence in that. And, uh, and I think uh, the, the new payment model only strengthens that idea. So um, you're going to see nurse practitioners and doctors working together more because um, uh, we're going to be facilitating that. And I, we can do that and build that out with confidence. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. And we've got to continue to build that out. It's been a challenge, of course, in the last number of years. But just remind people, our primary care networks have added 1,200 people to the primary care system to support better care for people who have a family doctor now and those who want one. We've added uh, um, urgent and primary care centers. So those are important. With respect to um, the, the uh, regional elements of this, it's true, people have different demands and different needs. But, you know, um, some things are common. We're seeing an increased complexity of patients everywhere as we have an aging population. For a long time, for example, Surrey, which is, very, which is obviously a critical community in BC, was the youngest community in BC. Well, now through to 2036, it's going to meet the provincial average in terms of age. In fact, the demands in Surrey for care are going to increase, and that is why we're building, for example, a new cancer care center at the new hospital in Surrey. So I, I think you're going to see that increase and that aging population equalize across the province. But you see in this agreement, and we haven't got into all of the details of it, more supports for rural care, and that the changes we're making in practice, some of which actually started in smaller and rural communities and are now bringing uh, to urban centers, are, gonna, are flexible enough to meet the needs of everyone. Because you're right, some communities that are younger need more episodic care and need to connect that care into the system. Some younger people don't really feel they need a family doctor. Maybe when uh, we're uh, uh, 27 and we're uh, in very good health, we may not see that. But we may if we're, um, you know, playing uh, Frisbee football or something and injure our legs, suddenly need care and need rehabilitation care over a period of time. And so those communities will need to strengthen out episodic care. Younger communities, you can imagine what some of them uh, might be in BC. I think Nelson's probably an example of that. And you have communities such as Victoria that have a lot of seniors who really will require a full service family doctor uh, or nurse practitioner or someone providing care and a full service clinic to support them with their varied health needs. Now BC has um, extraordinary levels of public health. One of the longest life expectancy for a country in the world. There are very few places on earth, Switzerland and Japan, maybe two of them, which have longer life expectancy. But that means we have more and growing demands on our healthcare system. So we have a flexible arrangement which will improve care in, in rural BC, improve care in urban BC, and allows uh, doctors to focus on care more than they ever have before. Thank you, Richard, for the question. I'll just respond and reiterate some of Minister Dick's remarks for the latter part of the question. Absolutely, there's a role for nurse practitioners and many of our allied healthcare professionals to help provide team-based care. And we know that to manage all of our patients' needs in this province, it cannot be done alone. And what I'm hoping is this new payment model is the anchoring, is the foundation to create the condition in which our patients can get the best type of quality care that they deserve. We need healthcare equity across the province, and we also understand that our rural and remote communities, their needs need to be met. I've met with many of our communities across the province, and what I can tell you is that rural and remote voice is always at our table as well at Doctors of BC. So whatever we are building, our hope is that the new future is upon us, and this transformational change will have the needs of everyone. And that's why I'm also hopeful about the Physician Master Agreement that it's building in healthcare equity. These concepts, as we know, are so essential that 
Every patient deserves a family doctor and to anchor in the supportive system of primary care, this looks like the way to kind of move in this direction and really transform the way that we've been able to provide the care for our patients in the community. And again, alongside us, we would benefit from all of our nurse practitioners, our colleagues that can work alongside us and within their scope of practice alongside ours, but now we're having conditions that will allow us to provide the type of care that we all train to provide. So this is, again, a very exciting time for us and there is still much work to do, but this is a start and we appreciate the collaborative efforts of this government. Our next question is from Amy Smart, Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Amy. Hi. Hi. I just have a question about the rostering system. Will it be a first come, first serve basis, or will be there? Will there be a way to prioritize urgency um, um, in terms well, of we'll who gets get the family doctor first? Yeah, and we'll we'll certainly be building on. We expect that rostering system to be in place in the middle of uh, next year as we work through these uh, extraordinary changes and. Uh, Obviously, that takes some time. We have such systems in place now. But obviously, uh, what the priority will be in part be provided by people who, uh, who require a full service family doctor. And so we want to ensure that their, their needs are met and that they'll have a place to go to get access to care. And that's important. And so we'll have inevitably there is a prioritization that occurs in that and that's the first thing. The second is for people who may not want that but need uh, their episodic care to be better integrated. And so both of those things are going to happen and we're going to use our places of episodic care whether they be walk-in clinics and uh, and and uh, urgent primary care centers and others to uh, to build out attachment across the board. So. I, I think that uh, we'll certainly be providing more details on rostering, but that is a it's a significant change to find to lay out who's attached, who who's attached to a particular clinic, and then be able to see where the opportunities are for people to uh, both add to uh, add a family doctor and to uh, and to find have one place they can go to do so. So I think all of that is of value. Inevitably, in the system, if you need care and you've gone to an emergency room or you've gone to an urgent primary care center or other pl or a walk-in clinic or other place and you clearly need um, a full service family practice that will obviously you'll obviously have be other places you can link in as well so uh, the rostering system is new it's something that we've wanted to do for a long time i think together and it's a it's a key aspect for patients in what we've agreed to today amy did you have a follow-up um, yes, one of the measures that you say will be compensated is the complexity of the patient. How do you measure that? Oh, um, I, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Desange, who deals with complexity of patients a lot, to talk about that because it's an important part of the agreement. But I, I, I think here's here's what I'd say that um, there are ways, and we've been, uh, I think, as a system, trying to do this for a long time. Uh, someone in my circumstance who has uh, type 1 diabetes. I'm walking in with type 1 diabetes to every appointment. I go and see Dr. Desange and whatever's bothering me on the day and whatever I need to see the doctor about on the day. And that adds to the complexity. It's the reason why people with chronic disease really need um, a full-time uh, healthcare practitioner to su support them and to understand when they walk in so I don't have to explain, oh, I'm a type 1. And here's, so and here's what's happening. They know because they have those results. We're seeing an increasing complexity of patients across the board. And so there are ways, and what you have is a detailed system of measuring complexity of patients. If you have, for example, um, a patient roster that's dramatically older or has a very significant group of people who have, uh, say, mental health and substance abuse issues, by definition, you have to spend more time with those patients. But the overall patient population is also increasing in complexity, and this agreement reflects that. And so at different times, we may have uh, significantly different needs of our healthcare system. We always need it, but at different times those needs may be uh, more intense for whatever reason. We're diagnosed with a chronic disease. Um, uh, obviously our whole maternity system is uh, a requirements of that. As we're younger, we, require, we have different needs than if we get into our teenage years. So I think what you need and what we have is a flexible model that fo focuses 
on the needs of patients and allows doctors to focus on care. But there are lots of ways to measure complexity. We have them in the agreement, and I'll ask Dr. Lusange to speak a little bit about how she does it in her practice. Thank you for the call. And just not to get too much into the details of the agreement, but the understanding that all healthcare systems around the world, especially primary care healthcare systems and the evaluation of them, and we've got in Canada, obviously, all of our research and healthcare policy abilities to be able to look through either MSOC scores, which may not may be irrelevant to everyone listening and may not know the details of that. But really what you look at is exactly that. Some of that Minister Dix just spoke of is that that time with the patient, what is the chronic condition or the disease and how does that burden the patient but also the needs of based on how many consultations they mean, need or how much the, the time they take with you in your clinic office setting and it's not necessarily just on aging but we've known that many of our aging populations and our geriatric populations do have needs for more time and the assessments in your office take a little bit longer but also I could say that the opposite for some of our younger po patient populations with complex either they've got some conditions that require a lot more work and effort or some of our BC cancer patients that need more time and those are the issues and conditions that are systemically built and assessment on a diagnosis code that physicians will input sometimes into their electronic medical record or to look at through the MSP billing guide that there's an opportunity to look at those individual codes and the complex care required by that patient or how many times that patient may have accessed the emergency room or the primary care setting or require diagnostics or tests and and that's where we look at that data and that's when we look at chronic complex patients we're not saying everyone does deserve care and access to primary care and that is our hope is to build a foundation to really work into the preventative aspect because right now we need to anchor all those patients that don't have a physician but we also need to recognize our need for healthcare prevention and to focus on wellness and well-being of our patient populations along with our public health experts and our people that are doing this work especially in our pediatric populations our mental health populations and our female populations and again like Minister Dix has said in our physician master agreement we actually have embedded gender equity and this is the first time we're seeing this and hopefully even the fee-for-service schedule we can modernize that payment schedule to reflect the needs of all patients and that is what I'm saying is building on health care equity this is a milestone for that question is for Vaughn Palmer Vancouver Sun please go ahead um hi I just wanted to check uh based on the answers we've had so far, you're not, you do not have an estimate of how many family doctors this will add to the number we have now, and you do not have an estimate of how many patients who do not now have a family doctor will be able to get one as a result of these changes. Is that correct? Uh, I, think, I think the answer is yes and no, Vaughn. We know from the changes we've made already that, uh, that these, these uh, new arrangements are going to increase the attractiveness of uh, family medicine and of family practice and of full-service family practice. We've seen that already with our new-to-practice contracts. We've seen that in the work we've done with our stabilization fund. So we've seen the impact of that. So secondly, um, I think that uh, what we see is that, uh, and you don't know exactly how something's going to work, but this is only one part of a number of measures. So this is foundational. This improves and incentivizes family practice and improves things for patients as well by building out uh, team-based care for them. And so I expect this will lead to more people and more doctors practicing for longer, being so existing doctors being stabilized in their, in their practices and attracting new people to uh, full-service family practice. So our expectation is that that will significantly increase things. But it is not a one-step response to a broader problem. We have a health human resources plan that has 70 items in it. We need to address residency spaces. This agreement supports that by, by ensuring that those 
doctors who are supporting residency programs are properly remunerated and it allows us to do what we've done, which is expand out residency programs. When you dramatically increase by 128 at UBC, the number of spaces, when 92% of those doctors stay in BC, you know that's going to mean more for full service family practice. So uh, the goal of this agreement in connection with the actions we're taking on internationally educated doctors, the actions we're taking with respect to training more doctors, and, and the focus on family practice and equalizing family practice against other kinds of medicines, it's going to have a very, very positive effect. We can't be exact. I think that's what you're asking about what that effect will be, but we know that it will be positive and it'll provide more care and support our primary care system. So that's the intent, that's the goal. All of the indications show that it is going to significantly improve things. This is an improved investment in that system. And the other part of rostering is it will allow us to more clearly monitor the effects of that on the system. So if you're asking this agreement, does this mean X number of new patients will be attached to a family doctor. You can't say that and guarantee that for sure because we will have to see how it happens in practice, but we will know, we know for a fact that will make things much better both for patients and for doctors and it's going to have a positive effect. But we can't just do this. We have to do all of the other things that we're proposing. There are 70 actions in our health human resources plan. We have to do all those things together. So it's building brick by brick in response to this massive period of demand on, health, on the healthcare system, a pandemic and the overdose public health emergency. Uh, in that context, we have to keep doing that. So this is one important action. It's foundational. We need to do other things as well. Helen, did you have a follow-up? Yes, please. Um, I'm still trying to understand um, the, uh, the new model payment for a full-time FTE, full-service family physician. So the 385000 uh, is is that a max? Uh, because I also think I heard, I think as I read it, that um, they're not, they, there's a, there's a minimum number of patients you have to see, but there isn't a max. And so if you exceed the uh, basic hours or the number of patients or the number of counters or all three, uh, can you go above that? And is there any ceiling on that? Well, uh, there are, as you know, uh, if you look at it's published every year, so everybody knows. There's no uh, secrets in, uh, in what we pay doctors as individuals or collectively. We know that there are doctors who work um, uh, very long hours and are very focused on that. And, uh, and uh, they, um, that group of doctors will also be supported by them. So we don't want a situation where someone is committed to doing that for their patients and is restricted in some way from doing that. And so that, that's the idea. But we're very specific in the new payment model. And we'll go through it because I think we did that in the, in the briefing, uh, uh, Vaughn, but we didn't do it in as great a detail here. It's based on providing 1,680 hours work, 1,250 patients of average complexity. So a doctor who might have higher complexity might have fewer than that conceivably. And that's one of the elements of the agreement. 5,000 encounters a year. And what this does is, and as a goal, it equalizes family, full service family practice against other types of medicine. So you're right, it may be possible if a doctor works well beyond that for them to earn more than that. And that would make sense. But this uh, links the, the amount doctors get paid to the care they provide. And it's very important based on the previous question to understand this. If you're in a fee for service system, your economic interests would be supported by having a very average patient base. For not, not necessarily, and patients sometimes complain about this. They say, I have very complex needs and I'm gonna need to see my doctor for a period of time and I have a difficult time finding a doctor, they might say, for that reason. I think many doctors make allowances for that and we know that this happens every day in the system. So what we have is a payment model based on the work done and based and focused on care that addresses doctors' issues around overhead. So if you're gonna do that, the fee-for-service system says you get a fee for service. You do more services, you get paid more. That system hasn't been working for patients, hasn't been working for doctors for some time. This provides a base structure that says this is the work you do and this is your remuneration. 
There will be some people who it might work, and you can work as little as 0.2, um, uh, for example, one day per week. And obviously, if you work 0.2, you get paid less. If you want to work more in the system and provide more care, the, we don't want to limit that because uh, that's care for patients. And we want patients uh, and all those patients who are both unattached and attached to get the care that they need. So um, this is, this is uh, the base. It lays out a base and it pro provides an alternative. And it is, I would argue, significantly, we would expect very significant number of doctors to take on um, this new uh, program. Uh, and there may be some who stay on fee-for-service, but this is, I think, a, an arrangement that doctors themselves co-designed and I think addresses the needs of the system. So what you're talking about, Vaughn, you're quite right. That is the base. You can do more than that if you do more work than the base. And of course, if you're working, say, 0.2 hours you would, uh, a week, you would get paid less than that. Our next question is from April Lawrence, Czech News. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. Thanks very much. Um, uh, my first question is for a colleague who's working up island today. Just wondering how this agreement uh, will make a difference, if at all, for rural hospitals like Port Hardy, where the ER has been closed there since Friday evening because of staffing issues and isn't going to open again till tomorrow morning. Um, in addition to what you're announcing today, what else is being done to improve healthcare in places like Port Hardy? So it's different in different communities, right? The issue um, in uh, Clearwater, say, has primarily been a nurse issue. And you'll note that there hasn't been closures in Clearwater as we've worked through those issues. The issue in Clearwater was, has been, in part, uh, an access to housing issue when we try and solve problems. And we've worked with the local community there uh, to get housing, temporary housing for people coming in and to support uh, that emergency room. The issue. Uh, in, uh, in, northern, in northern and Vancouver Island communities has tended to be access to doctors. Uh, and, and really, uh, the core primary care doctor in a community such as Port Hardy and such as Point, uh, Port McNeil is one of the things we've had in mind in the various elements of this agreement. And uh, uh, you know, I've been told not to do 15-minute answers, so I'm not going to do that in this case, although, I, uh, although uh, we certainly will uh, be happy to brief on that question. But this supports primary care doctors working in small communities and large. There's specific arrangements to support uh, health care in rural BC, to support uh, the MOCAP program, which is important for many communities in BC. And I think it's, uh, in general, supporting that core of primary care doctors who also, in many communities, the core of providing emergency services in, uh, in smaller hospitals such as in Port Hardy. So um, I think in that sense, it will be supportive of that. But again, it's not one answer, but many to dealing with health human resources. We have added uh, 38,000 people net to the healthcare system, 600 new family doctors in five years, and yet um, we've also added dramatically to the demands on the system, and we're living through two public health emergencies. So we have to continue to do that work. In some communities, this agreement will be very helpful. In other communities where the issue around the emergency room is not doctors but nurses, uh, we have to take other steps as well. April, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, um, one I, I think maybe for Dr. Desange, um, obviously one of the, the key goals here is connecting people with, with family doctors, but I'm wondering for those British Columbians who do already have a family doctor, what sort of real changes, if any, uh, will they notice once this new payment model comes into effect? Thank you, Abra, for that question. I think an immediate sigh of relief, which I'm hearing from many of my colleagues who just are watching probably this briefing this morning and also may have received uh, my president's letter that went out this morning from Doctors of BC. I've been hearing already and I think the moral distress that when we speak of and the burdens and the administrative tasks that in a day that you're inundated with lab results or diagnostic reports or that pull you away from your patient encounters and for all those physicians that have needed to be compensated for the time because maybe it takes longer or they work at a different pace than some of my other colleagues. I know I was one of them. And to be able to be compensated for a block of time and to be able to take that time with your patient if need be, as well as seeing them 
with their complexities and really getting time and building space for even your clinical teaching without having to take another um, break or allowing the capacity to change. So really a renewed sense of hope and optimism that a lot of family doctors have been facing and addressing the overhead and the rising costs of business is a major one in this new payment model. And also another way of allowing our family doctors to know that we've been listening. We did some robust engagement early summer and we've been doing that through our divisions of family practice across the province for many years. And I feel that finally they have been heard and we've listened carefully and co-created this model with a lot of significant input from the physicians on the ground. They've been telling us what they need to be able to serve their patients better. And I truly believe that this is the way forward. I think that when we think about primary care and health healthcare systems and what we need to build in the 21st century in this province to be evidence, to be able to be a reputable healthcare system that provides the needs for all of our patients. This is the first step. And I really am truly excited embarking on this journey because I truly think that our patients will see a little bit more livelihood and a breathing room with the locum the commitment to locum coverage for our physicians that have never never been able to take time off or step away from their office because of the needs and the demands on them. This will enable them to have a healthier working environment and that's all we can hope for is to create better working environments and conditions that foster better care for our patients because we know healthier physicians and doctors make healthier patients and this is the way that we need to be working. For our final question today, we're going to come back to the room. Please go ahead. A uh, question for Minister Dix uh, in English and en français, s'il vous plaît. Um, to what I understand, doctors were paid before 30 to $40 per visit. Can you help us understand how much they can get now under this new system? So this is a change. Um, we went, we're going from a fee-for-service system where your payment depended on the number of services you provided, all of which had their own fee codes. So there are different fee codes for different services, but you're, you're not in the wrong range there when you're talking about what you're talking about. So it depends. It depended. But uh, really, your ability to make a living and to pay your administrative costs and your staff and everyone else involved depended on the number of services you provided, uh, you, number of services that you are remunerated for by a specific fee for each service. Here, we're changing the dynamics significantly. There was an alternative previously, which tended to be contracts. So you were salaried, and there was, and between those two options, there was uh, not a lot of flexibility, right? And so um, this changes that. It focuses the payment on the care provided, the hours of work provided, the patients attached, the complexity of those patients. So it creates a whole number of new factors that aren't just about having a large number of people come through the practice and providing them with care, 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 care individually. It, it pays for the continuum of care, the work doctors do outside of the direct care for patients, and it, and it uh, also allows them to get supported for the complexity of their patient panel. So we have a minimum patient panel, we have a, uh, a minimum number of hours worked every year, a number of visits that need to be provided, but it gives doctors more flexibility. They're not simply paid. If they want to increase their salaries by bringing more patients through or taking more time at the practice and providing um, you know, what is not cookie cutter care, because that's not the care doctors provide, but is paid before like cookie cutter care. And so this is a fundamental change. This is an option that allows doctors to continue to run their medical practice with independence, but recognizes the work that they do. And it is, a, I think, a fundamental change from a system that's been 80% fee-for-service uh, in terms of MSP billings uh, right up to recent years. It's gone down a little bit in the last couple of years, but the most fee-for-service problems to one where a lot of doctors are going to be working on this new model. I think that's good news for patients and everywhere else. Je dirais en français que nous avons un système actuellement qui, qui uh, paye un, doctor, uh, un médecin spécifiquement pour un service. Pour un service pour, disons, 27 dollars, c'est une visite individuelle ou quoi que ce soit. 
il y a des, euh, des frais différents pour, chaque, pour des différents services. C'est un peu compliqué, c'est développé ensemble maintenant. Ceci va changer cela. On va mettre l'accent sur les soins donnés aux, aux, aux gens qui visitent, aux personnes, aux patients, ce qui est essentiel dans un système où on veut une transformation. Donc, c'est pas fee for service actuellement, ou un frais pour chaque service, mais on va payer pour les heures travaillées, pour la complexité des gens qui sont, euh, qui, euh, qui reçoivent euh, les soins d'une médecin euh, en, pour, en, en général et qui va, qui va donner aussi des soutiens, euh, des soutiens pour euh, des frais administratifs des médecins. Donc, c'est un modèle qui euh, met l'accent sur les, les patients et pas sur un système presque industriel de donner des soins. C'était euh, OK dans le passé et c'était aussi, euh, aussi une exigence des médecins dans le passé, mais, mais c'est les médecins eux-mêmes avec nous qui ont dit que ce système ne, ne marche pas ne marche plus et il faut un changement. Et ceci est un changement fondamental de ce système-là. Um, question for uh, Dr. Dosange. Uh, you said often that you wanted to abandon the, the fee-for-service system. How satisfied are your members now and how many do you hope will opt for this and also what will happen after three years? I think I, my hope is we've built what they've asked for in a sense of the most desirable outcome when we think about the care that our patients deserve and the conditions that we deserve to work in. So I'm hoping that there will be great uptake. I think a lot of it is going to be telling our members, not all of our physician members are yet aware of it, so we have to speak about the process and what it looks like and how we switch on February 1st. Like Minister Dick says, this is not a contract and this is not the fee for service but it's a middle road in which we can provide the ability and opportunity for physicians to work in a new way and really that's considering all of the burdens and the tasks we're hearing about the indirect care so checking your labs speaking to your consults and really organizing all of the needs and demands from your office work and being able to be compensated from that as opposed to doing it on the side of your desk or when you take it home later on in the evening. We're also noticing that the remuneration for the time that you're spending for your patients, so the base rate, hourly rate, and then encounter rate on top of that to really acknowledge that time that you're spending for patients and their complexity of care. And also, again, to address the rising costs of business. I know that from many of our members that heard even of the stabilization interim funding that Minister Dix and I announced earlier this year, that was really hopeful for many of the physicians on the ground. And what I really want to reiterate today is that people that feel the value, family physicians have eroded the sense of their value for their patients over time because of the working conditions. And unfortunately, some of the systems compensate transactional care. And what we are trying to provide is this real attention to the need for longitudinal primary care and family medicine. And the needs of that, all citizens and all of our patients in this province and this country deserve that type of care. Someone to look after all of their needs and their family needs and know them well in a relationship-based setting. Also to prevent things from happening from knowing their genetics and knowing their history and anchoring whatever virtual supports we're providing for care into this longitudinal family practice because we know that those physicians know their patients best and it also simplifies care with our specialist colleagues when you're consulting there's someone else that's championing that care and, and, and that fine thread that links you all together so to be able to provide that support i really will be looking forward to meeting many of my colleagues um, this week and the weeks coming up to see the robust uptake and really that hope and optimism of shifting into a new way of doing things. We've all known what it takes to provide quality care. We learn it, healthcare systems, many of us are interested in it, how to reform this primary care system. And here we are, we're here with a new dawn and I hopefully thinking that we're leading into this with intention for our patients and to serve their needs 
higher than all other priorities. We know that they need our help. And as physicians, we do that in our clinics, we do that in our hospitals, and allow us to be able to be inputting into the way that we actually are compensated and valued for our time. And thank you very much, Dr. Desange. Uh, I just want to say, you know, um, I think what we're doing today is both historic and foundational. Uh, and it, it is there in place to allow us both to stabilize and support our current practices, to make it more attractive for people to become family doctors. We've already seen how that works, to reflect the growing complexity of uh, primary care needs of people. As we get older, our needs become more complex. This agreement does that. To support health care provision in rural and remote communities, the agreement does that. But it's not anything more than one step, but a foundational one, this transformation of our primary care system that we've worked on together is critical. It will require continued investment and effort in other areas to ensure that we add medical school sp spaces. We're doing that ensure it's easier for, uh, and we support team-based care, which we're doing, and we need to do more of to provide better care to people. So this is one step, it's a foundational step, and uh, it's good news for patients today, and it's good news for not just now, for doctors now, but in the future. The new payment model is simply put, a much better arrangement than continuing on in fee-for-service, and we are confident that's a much better arrangement for patients. And we're going to see progress on all of the issues we make together. One agreement doesn't solve all of the issues that we face. But again, it's found, it allows us to take all of the measures we need to take together to improve access for those who are unattached, those who need episodic care, and those who are already attached to get better care and better fundamental care in the province. And that's, uh, that's the work we have to continue to work on. This is. Uh, this is uh, one step, but I would say it's a pretty big step, and it's one that people have been waiting for for a long time. And we got here because we worked together, and we're going to continue to work together to ma make sure the needs of patients li w living in communities big and small around BC get the care they need in primary care. That helps us them stay healthy, and it helps us also in providing all the other care we do in our health care system. I want to thank you all for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Can you take a picture? Can you take a picture? Why don't we do this?